I've been talking about how we got our, our Bible. I want to continue today. I finished in the first service, so I hope to be able to finish in the second service here too. A lot of people have a problem with the Bible that we read today. They always say there, there's all kinds of contradictions and there's mistakes and it was only written by men and, and they go way back and they start talking about how these mistakes were made and they read up on these things from all these people that have all this doubt in the inerrant word of God. When I say inerrant word of God, what am I saying? I'm saying that it's without flaw. It's perfect. Does anybody believe that? Yeah. Raise your hand if you believe it. Okay, a lot of people didn't raise your hand. And I'm here to tell you that by going back last week and this week, you're going to see how it was preserved. I had Rhonda bring an example. Rhonda has had this for quite a while. And I had her bring this uh, this morning from Yemen. Uh, well, she's from here, but the, the scroll is from Yemen. 750 years ago, this was written down. It is a leather. The best, uh, the best scrolls out there were able to do it on calf skin. Okay, the ewe sheep or calf skin. Calf skin lasted a long, long time. Even cow, mature uh, cows didn't last as long, and you couldn't write as neat as you could uh, calf skin. Okay. And so uh, this is called vellum, and that's, that's what it was written on. And these vellum scrolls, uh, which you will find thousands of these around the world, okay? And you can find them very old. A lot of these vellum scrolls that are there are absolutely accurate to the word that we have today. And so a lot of people try to say, well, it didn't mean that, and it's more accurate this way. I'm here to tell you that the word of God has, at least in one avenue, been absolutely truth all the way through. All the way through. Because the Lord, Psalm says that the Lord preserved it in the earth seven times. Now, if you want to know what that seven times is, that's a whole other week that I can take. But I believe that the Lord today has preserved it Seven times, because that's what he said. And what that seven times means, we can go over at a later date. Let's pray. Lord, I just ask that people in here, Lord God, would believe. There would be absolutely no doubt where the word of God came from, how we get it, how accurate is it. Help us, Lord God, to have faith. But even, Lord God, even if we didn't have all the scrolls to prove it, would we still believe? Because there's faith involved. And yet with that faith, we have to make sure that there is some validity to it. A lot of people have faith. A lot of people have faith that the earth is flat. A lot of people have faith that, well, Lord, the bottom line is, is there's certain things that we know. And once we know them, then we don't have to have faith in those things. We have faith in the things that are true, things that are real. And the word of God is inerrant. It's absolutely real and without flaw. So bless the word this morning, and please bless the teaching in Jesus' name. Amen. Most of the time, everybody knows that I preach here, but last week I taught, and today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach. We talked about the Gospels, the history of the church, Paul's epistles, the general epistles. Um, we talked about the book of prophecy, which is Revelation. And now we're going to get into a little different part of this. So from the beginning of the church, the Old Testament was used in the synagogues. Uh, as the New Testament was written about Christ, it was cited right along with the Old Testament. In other words, the New Testament and the Old Testament... Um, once Christ came, were cited side by side, okay? There was validity, in other words, to both of them, and they were given the same type of credentials. So it wasn't just the Torah anymore. It just wasn't the Tanakh anymore. Um, you're going to find that Peter made reference, and others made, even Christ made reference. But let's start with Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 18. 1 Timothy 5, 18. Paul quotes, actually, from Luke chapter 10 and verse 7. But the way that it's used, in fact, yesterday I was looking up a ton of stuff in the office, 
and there's 43 pages, solid pages, 43 pages of nothing but where one mentions another, mentions another, mentions another, mentions another, and that is how this whole thing is put together and given its validity as people that we knew were eyewitnesses to the cross or eyewitnesses to those people, then they mentioned other people that were accurate and that were real in their writings. And so it goes on and on for 43 pages. I won't give you the 43 pages today, but 1 Timothy 5, 18 says, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. Well, who's he quoting when he says that? Okay, we actually, you go back to Luke in 10, 7. It says in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. So you, you see, one quotes the other. And at a later date, which we're going to get into the different uh, scrolls that were actually put together, they constantly go back and they mention what the other one had said. In other words, they give validity to it. And they keep going. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 1, and I'm only going to give you two or three of these, and then I'm going to move on. The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. What he's saying is, I want you to remember what the prophets had said. So he's going back to the Old Testament, and then he has the audacity, unless it's absolutely real and true, to put themselves in that same category into what we're telling you. Isn't that something? That's like me standing up here and saying, everything I tell you today, I want you to put it in the same category as the prophets. I, I wouldn't tell you that because I hate rocks. <laughs> Peter also attributed all the writings of Paul in 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 15. 2 Peter 3, 15. Peter, remember who Peter was, okay, when it comes to the apostles. Peter was one that even the Catholic Church took Peter, although he never, we don't even... I won't even get into this. Please do. <laughs> I, I like these little trails, but I made it through the first service by reading my notes, so I'm just going to continue on his path. But Peter, the Lord told Peter, I'm going to build my church upon this rock, okay? And so he had a lot of authority. So when he speaks in 2 Peter 3.15, it says, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. Speaking of them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, and to their own destruction." He's mentioning Paul. He's saying that Paul is writing these things and the wisdom that's involved in this is off the cuff. I mean, right off the cuff, and yet it is absolutely true. In other words, God has anointed Paul also. So Peter goes back and he mentions the Old Testament and says, we're in the same category as the Old Testament. Well, okay, well, you got the New Testament, but you got 13 others, possibly 14, depending on who wrote Hebrews in the New Testament that was written by Paul. And so he now mentions Paul now was also anointed. And so now that takes up these books. And so the way that it was put together, it had to be eyewitnesses of what was going on. And then people writing about those eyewitnesses, exactly either firsthand or secondhand. And before, before the second century ever came in, every single bit of the scripture was already written. Every bit of it. Between Revelation was between 90 and 95. 
And so it was all put together. The original manuscripts were written on papyrus, which is totally different. Papyrus, is what, uh, it was an aquatic Egyptian plant, and they would take that plant, and they would be able to roll it out, and they, could, uh, and they would put it down horizontally. And they were able to have it, you know, this big, but they, were, they could string it out as long as they could, as long as they could roll it into each other. The problem with uh, aquatic plants is they're very sensitive to sun, and so they didn't last for a long, long time. And so after a while, uh, the papyrus, they stopped writing on it. It was one of the best things to write on uh, because of how smooth it was and how good it took the ink. And then after a period of time, we came up with something uh, that was able to clean them. And, uh, and I don't know what it is, but they would put it on the papyrus and it actually would bring back the letters and the ink that was in the papyrus. And so they have done that now in being able to read a lot more scrolls. And you can see a lot more of these scrolls. Uh, you can see it in Paris. You can see them at the British Museum. You can see us at the, the Shrine of the Scroll in Jerusalem. They have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. And all of them will tell you that the word that you hold in your hand today is absolutely accurate and true. They have the book of Isaiah, the Shrine of the Scroll. And it's in a special, uh, how many have seen that? Amen. A couple of you, good. They, um, it's, it's in a special glass, and you press a little button, and it, it puts a certain light on it so it doesn't hurt it. And you can actually be able to read it. And the people that read it, it is verbatim, verbatim, exactly what you and I hold in our hands today translated. Isn't that cool? And by the way, we didn't know that until they found that scroll. And so if they found it and knew that it was accurate, why wouldn't the others also be accurate? The original New Testament was written in Greek. We talked about that. The Old Testament also translated to the Greek, which, which was called the Septuagint. Remember, uh, we talked about the 70 that was able to put that together. Um, the Syriac translation was written uh, in Aramaic. And so these were translated before 150 A.D. and were the official scriptures in the whole Eastern churches for hundreds of years. From this, translations were made uh, to the Arabic, to the Persian, to the Armenian, and these, these are what's called the uh, Peshito, okay? The Peshito translations or scripts. Uh, the Latin Vulgate became the official translation uh, for all of the Western churches, and that in the fourth century. And that was put together by the famous Jerome. So Jerome, with the Latin Vulgate, uh, put that together, it went for a thousand years. All the Western Christians lived off the Vulgate for one, the Latin Vulgate for 1,000 years. Now they have the Latin Vulgate. So if you have the Latin Vulgate and you're able to read the Latin Vulgate, well, it's interesting for 1,000 years that Latin Vulgate lines up with what you have right here. And you can read it. There are places you can go into, like the British Museum, that they've actually translated word for word. It's hard in English, um, only because it's like reading the original 1611 Bible. Okay, if you read the original 1611 Bible, you'll get it if you understand English. But most people don't understand English, so it's very difficult. Now, the facts that are revealed here, just by what we've gone over so far, is the New Testament was completed by the second century. It was done. It was absolutely done. And it was accepted as the new covenant by the church. So from eyewitnesses and the fresh letters that they held at the time, so off of those letters, we know that what we have is correct. And it was done by the second century. The accuracy of the New Testament can be traced back within 100 years of the apostles. Or less. 100 years. Even the book of Revelation was from 90 to 95 AD. Was accepted as the final prophecy book to this book. 
the completion. They believed it, actually. The book of Revelation was a revelation of Jesus Christ, which meant this, this revelation, short 22 chapters at the very end right here, basically gave you a total overview of the whole thing, of who Christ is. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, Word is with God, and the Word was God. So in the beginning, Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. So at the very end, you read this whole thing to get to know who? Jesus. It's not all your knowledge. It's not your wisdom. It's not so you can be proud of everything that you know because you've memorized the whole thing. Congratulations. You get a smiley sticker. Okay? <laughs> but at the very end of it, it's so you know Jesus Christ. And then at the end, you have revelation. Open it up, and it says, this is a revelation of who he is. Does it line up with everything that you have learned? And everybody goes, well, there's only one book I really have a problem with. And that's the book of Revelation. Well, the book of Revelation is just what? It's, it's an unveiling of who he really is. So when you read the book of Revelation, everybody reads it and makes it so hard. Try to understand that the book of Revelation is just to reveal Christ to you. There are hundreds of manuscripts that were written in many languages during the 3rd and the 4th century. So the reason for that is because they wanted to spread it out more and more. But the problem with that is for those that know of Diocletian, Diocletian was evil, to, to absolutely evil. Um, he was a destroyer, a Roman emperor that absolutely destroyed everything that had to do with God and the people that read it. If you got caught reading any of, of those scrolls, then you were put to death and the scroll was burned. And so he went out, grabbed any of these particular uh, pages that were out there, and he made sure that they were burned. So now the, the, what we know to be the earliest form of the Bible that they had, um, if the Roman emperor was out there burning them, now it became very hard to get a hold of, very difficult, hard to find. And I think now what we got... Ten of them in every house in here. He ordered the destruction of all the Christian writings along with the Christians that would be reading him. He was a Hitler in his time. It was a great attempt from Emperor Constantine. Constantine came into power in 312 AD. When he came into power, what he did is he combined two things. He combined our government along with Christianity. There's a word for that. It's called Pergamum. Pergamus, the church at Pergamum. So Pergamus means mixed marriage. So the church now was married into the state. But Constantine, was he had a great heart. He really wanted to do what was right. And so he said, listen, let's go ahead. Let's bring Christianity back out. But we're basically going to oversee it. But he, he had a good heart by doing that. So he ordered Eusebius who is a great father, actually, of faith in the early church, to prepare 50 copies of the Scripture to be based in unity with all the churches, and it was to be given to every church to learn. 50 copies. So now what we have is 50 copies. The rest of them have been destroyed. When you were handed a, a copy of that, you got to remember in the, in the world at that time, if Constantine walked up to you and handed you this book, that is one of 50 copies around the world, and that's why it was held so close to their hearts. 50 copies. I have that many in my house. I got 20 in my office. And there was only 50 at that time that we know of that were put together. For the most part, Honestly, that was the start of the Catholic Church as a legal union between the state and the church. And we know that as Pergamus, which means mixed marriage. And his effort was to be commended, uh, but the result was a dictator church. And that dictator church wasn't necessarily uh, the government running the church. It's the church that actually started running the government. <laughs> it became the government. There are thousands of ancient manuscripts. Most scholars would tell you that there are over 4,000 Greek 
manuscripts of the New Testament. There's 8,000 of the Latin Vulgate. So, I mean, you could still get a hold of these. And there's a 1,000 other ancient versions. And this means that we have around 13,000 ancient manuscript or parts of the New Testament. That's a total of 1,700 fragments of the Old Testament and 350 copies of the Greek Septuagint on top of it. What this proves is that there are no other books or religious entities that have so much written documents and information on it than the, and the authenticity of this right here to prove that it is accurate, it is real, and it is true. It's been written about more times than any other thing in the world. And it still has held up to be true to this day. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> I've, I've studied a lot on this. And going back, I, I opened up a, a, a study yesterday that was huge. There's 43 copies, uh, or 43 pages of this other study. And I thought, boy, if everybody just had a copy of that, they could study it for themselves because this guy did an excellent job. And I always, I always hate comparing my work to somebody else's because then I just want to rip mine up and throw it away. Okay, because there are people that are really good at information and research and putting it down. And with me, I'm too ADD to stay on track with anything. I got a, we got a book that's going to come out one day. My wife has to proofread it, but it's the story of my wife and I and, and me getting shot and all that happening to me. And, and a year ago, it was finished, and, and we just still kind of go through it and say, well, what's the purpose? Everybody has a testimony. Mine's just a testimony, too. And getting it out, you notice that um, we want to make sure that it's accurate. But if you give that to somebody just to write, Unless you are right there, they can miss something or they get it out of order. And it's easy. There's a movie that's going to be done. And the guy, the producer of that, his name is Jamim or Jamin. And when I talk to him, it's very important that I, the information is true and correct. So Jamin, this is the order that it happened. Because it's really easy for him to say, so your son did this and then your other son. No, no. The other son did it first and then this son. And so we constantly have to go back to it. Now, the only way that we could do that in Scripture is to go back to the earliest that we can. And if you go back to the earliest that you can, then you're going to find there are three uh, there's different manuscripts that are out there. There's three huge different manuscripts. Uh, the Sinaitic manuscript was AD 340. That's at the British Museum. That's written in Greek. That was found, and we've been to the spot at St. Catherine's Church, which is on your map. It's in the, uh, it's in the Sinai Peninsula. Now, that is not where Mount Sinai is. It's not in the peninsula, the Sinai, according to uh, scripture, it was actually in the Midian mountain range, okay? That's right across the water. And so, for some odd reason, we have, uh, in, in fact, it was a relative of Constantine, supposedly, that renamed the whole thing and brought people into the Sinai Peninsula, believing that that was the area. But, getting out of that, see, my brain just wants to go now. That's a great study if you've never done that study. But that manuscript was found in that church, okay? Uh, and that was in 1844. Um, and it's interesting because the actual person that found it was Dr. Konstantin Tischendorf. Konstantin Tischendorf. Isn't that funny? So he spotted them uh, when after the uh, revolution in 1917. It was sold to the British Museum. And it sold at that time for $500,000. When you got a manuscript that was put out in 340, then that manuscript, you want it, okay? Because it's going to be, it's going to have first-hand information. The Vatican manuscript was AD 350. That sits in the Vatican in, in Rome, Italy now. You can actually see it. They have a lot of stuff in private rooms at the Vatican. Um, they're 
the Vatican has a city underneath it that uh, most of us would never get into. But they have some of the riches of this world as far as manuscripts. Uh, they hold them. I think they like to have them, control them. But that was first brought out in 1481. It was kind of a secret of the Vatican for years. They never let people look at it. And it was finally open for someone to see uh, after an English biblical scholar was permitted to study it for several days. He claimed to have memorized it and he wanted to produce it. So then the Pope in 1889 decided to let it be photographed and released to the libraries of the world. And so those libraries uh, got it and were able to study it. It's very, very, very well preserved, okay? Now it can be read and translated by others. But after that, the famous one, the Alexandrian manuscript, was put together in A.D. 450. Um, you can see this at the Alexandrian uh, Museum. Uh, that's right where our bus, uh, we had a bus full of people. The car flipped in front of us, and we smashed into it. And uh, so I was in the middle of the desert calling up Rhonda from TMI going, uh, help, we're in the middle of the desert and we're off the road into the sand. We almost flipped the bus and, and there were three uh, Egyptians that were in the car. The car was crushed underneath, literally, and we see this smoke that's coming out of the car. So we had me and a couple others in the front. And we're taking sand and we're just taking the sand of the desert and we're shoving it onto the car, trying to keep it from coming into flames while they're helping three gentlemen out of the car. The car was crushed all but one corner right behind the driver's seat that was no bigger than that right there. Three grown men, because of the centrifugal force when they flipped and us hitting it, it threw all of them into that section of the car, and it's the only part of the car that was not crushed. All three got out, and they said, praise be to your God, he saved us. <laughs> we told them that we prayed, and the Lord delivered them. Isn't that cool? And they all got out. They were scratched up a little bit. Sometimes God has to scratch us up a little bit. Now, the Alexandrian manuscript... Um, you can, you can go now. It's at the British Museum. So you can see this. It was given and it was presented to King James in 1627. Um, well preserved, well read for a script that is 1600 years old. The Ephraim manuscript is AD 450. That was written in Greek. It was, you can see it at the National Library in Paris. I uh, don't want to get into all of that. And as far as how it was written and all that, it's kind of longer, but um, there were many texts that were found. The Alexandrian manuscript is the one that uh, later it was confirmation that King James, when he ordered the actual Bible written, later on he got confirmation. And he was absolutely happy because he was sure that everything in 1611 which was the King James Bible, when it was put together, it was accurate and it was true. And we're going to discuss that uh, in just a second. The Beza Manuscript in 500. Uh, there's a couple other manuscripts that sit in Washington, D.C., one in Cambridge University. The Fathers of the Faith wrote many scripts that feathered in the New Testament and the Old Testament. These men were the bridge to the ancient manuscripts and the New Testament. They were also the earliest leaders in the Christian church after the days of the apostles. We read about them. We call them the fathers of our faith. They were very educated men. They were very, very well respected in their time for the knowledge that they had, what they have read, and what they wrote. Their main knowledge was on the apostles, the Old Testament, the prophets. They were brilliant men, and they lived at the time as eyewitnesses. And you'll read about them, but one is Clement of Rome, um, born in 30, died in 100 A.D., quoted many times from the letters that we have today. Matthew, Luke, Romans, Corinthians, Hebrews, 1 Timothy, 1 Peter. We have his writings verifying the accuracy of the translation of uh, of the day of these books. The next one was Ignatius, 
Uh, he was born in 30, but he lived to 110. And Ignatius was referred to uh, the four Gospels as he called him the word of Jesus. And often quoted the words of Jesus to the people of his day, bringing in the same examples that the apostles did. Again, verifying the validity of the words of the Gospels in that day from those particular group of people as eyewitnesses. Polycarp was 69 to 155 A.D. He was a disciple of John. Mentions that in Scripture. But the eldest of the disciples to live the longest. Uh, in only one very clear letter, he himself quotes from two-thirds of the books, uh, the letter of the New Testament, not only verifying their discipleship with Jesus, but the words that they wrote in 60 A.D. are, in fact, the same words that you and I read today. The next one, from 130 to 200, uh, and that's Irenaeus. He's one of the biggest writers and quoters of the works and the words of the apostles. He quotes from the New Testament over 1,800 times in his writings. He quotes from many writings verifying the works and the words of Christ and his apostles. These writings are still read today by thousands as historical facts and the happenings and eyewitnesses in biblical times. Tertullian was the last one from 150 to 220. A lot of people have heard of Tertullian, but uh, he was by far one of the biggest writers of the validity of the actual manuscripts and letters of the New Testament. And so he's making reference to 7,200 times in the New Testament in his writings. These writings verify the authenticity of the original Scripture. Now, when we read Scripture, it's important that we take Scripture out of um, what's called the original manuscripts, okay? The original manuscripts, majority script, uh, that is what the King James Bible, for instance, comes off. The New King James is the same. Literal translations come off of the majority manuscripts. There's other of the minority manuscripts or other from different uh, manuscripts that were written by Unitarians and people that didn't believe in the Trinity of God, the deity of God. And, and so these manuscripts were not allowed in the things that we read, okay? But in nowadays, they like to take these writings that they're finding in these manuscripts and they like adding it to what we have, thinking that if they add it to what we have, it'll only bring just a little more validity to the times. So but what it does is it adds in just a thought that is different from the majority script. And we have to be very careful in doing that. In all the writings of the early church fathers, all but 11 verses of the New Testament are made mention of by these five early fathers that we just talked about. What this means is very important. We can trace the actual words of the New Testament within a few years, months, or even days that they were written in the original manuscripts. Now let's go over the translations really quick, coming to this point. The first one we talked about a little bit, but the Latin Vulgate, A.D. 450, that was the famous one by Jerome, okay? Okay. That was from Hebrew, Greek, and Latin manuscripts. The next one is Wycliffe's version. In 1382, well, they went by the Latin Vulgate, I told you, for all of that time. Okay, But in 1382, the Wycliffe version came in. He was the first to translate the Bible okay, into a language that could be understood uh, by the English. He considered it to be the morning star of Reformation. That's what everybody said, the Wycliffe uh, version was. Wycliffe version was probably out of the Latin Vulgate and in the Wycliffe version, it was what probably uh, Luther was reading when Martin Luther decided that he was going to start his own little reformation based on what he knew that the scripture said. Okay? The Latin Vulgate translated over when Wycliffe did it in 1382, uh, they called him the Morning Star of Reformation. Uh, because that version uh, now could fall into the hands of the average person. And the average person then could read it. And you could understand it. Um, it wasn't put into all the, the deep words. Okay? Um, 
And then from there, well, actually, it was 1455 that the Bible was first printed on a press for all to read. And in 1517, uh, because of the ability to study ourselves, the Reformation was actually able to take place for the Protestant church, uh, all because of the Wycliffe Bible. After that, you have the Tyndale Bible of 1534 that went to the Coverdale Bible. The Coverdale Bible of 1535, that was the next printing, the big printing that took place to even get more Bibles out to you and I. Okay, those Bibles, um, they didn't look like this, but obviously they were, they were leather and wood, believe it or not. Most of the Bibles back then, in order to build a cover on them, the cover was usually a soft leather or it had, some of them had wood covers. I have a lot of different, very, very old Bibles in my office at my house that I could bring and show you how they were put together. But the Geneva Bible, which is the one that we even passed out here for a while, the hardcover, is in 1560. And that's William Whittingham. And he was the first to use uh, in the Geneva Bible. He's the one that took the Bible and actually put it into verses and chapters. Because to make reference to is very difficult within the letter. Okay? With it back then... Uh, if they did that, they said it was in the letter of Peter in the fourth paragraph on. So, I mean, it was very difficult to get to within a group. So uh, what uh, what the Geneva Bible did is it split it up into chapters and verses to where now we can all follow along. And that was very, very important for the time. The Bishop's Bible came in 1568, and then after that, we have the King James, 1611. After King Henry VIII uh, severed his ties with the Catholic Church, a huge want for all of these Bibles came, but yet we didn't have it, okay? Um, wouldn't, for some odd reason, they just wouldn't produce enough, so on October 27th, uh, 2nd, uh, no, that's a different date. On July 22nd, 1604, King James I announced that he would appoint 54 of the best scholars in the world to translate the scripture. This was the most thorough translation, and everyone will agree to this. Wherever you go to find out about the Bible, they will tell you that these 54 men were the best of the world for the most thorough translation ever done to this date um, of Scripture to accurately translate into an understood language that was accurate to the point that we could all read. Six different groups of scholars would take a section of the Scripture and translate it. So we had six groups of these scholars. And your job was to translate your section. Then your translation was examined by the other five. It went from that group to that group to that to make sure that that word was translated over accurately in the culture and the people that they were talking to, which is very important. And then a committee was chosen of six, again, from all the translating groups to final the accuracy of the translation, keeping the same spirit through the text. In other words, the same spirit through the text meant you had to understand the people. You had to understand who it was written to. You had to understand the culture that was going on to keep everything accurate. What we have in our Bible today is the most accurate Translation produced. The version stood by itself for years without any opposition because of the careful measure which was taken to translate it. Its smooth poetic style was based on the Wycliffe's 1382 version. It made it so inviting. It was, they called it majestic. Isn't that cool? It said it was not matched by any translation to this day as one that sticks in the minds of the people that read it. There was no record left to find out where these manuscripts are that were used to do it. King James did something with the, all the original manuscripts. And so they were put away. 
If you find them, let me know. I'll buy them from you. But I want to be the first guy because <laughs> I know if you go somewhere else, they're going to give you a hundred times what I'm going to give you. But the later manuscripts that have been found have verified the accuracy of this translation. I don't care if they found the Dead Sea Scrolls or whatever. You, they're gonna, everything's going to lead back to the accuracy of what these 54 men did. There have been, in the past 100 years, many have tried to translate the scripture to make it easier to read, but few match the majestic sound and the abilities of the King James Version. I've been asked uh, many times, so are you just a King James only man? No, I'm not actually. I'm a King James, New King James. I am a majority script, mainly majority script person. I want to go off to the majority text. I don't want to go on minority text. I don't want to go off into the apocryphal books. I don't want to, I believe in the majority text. I believe in the Septuagint. Uh, I believe that what we have today is accurate. Now, there's other Bibles that are out there. You have the Catholic Bible that has uh, it has these, but it also, it's added on some apocryphal books. They do that for history. They do that, uh, you know, they got the book of Maccabees. They got the book of wisdom. They got these other books that they have in there. Um, we, uh, I talked last week about the whole canonized part of it. And so I kind of dealt with it last week. But what we have today in this Bible, you need to know is absolutely accurate and true. The other, you can buy the other historical books and everything, keep them as historical books and other things, but don't have it as the divinely inspired. You could just keep them for the books at the time to understand the culture, okay? The Maccabees is all about the Jews and what happened, and so great to read. But then you get into the book of like Enoch or something. Anybody here read the book of Enoch? A lot of people in jail read the book of Enoch. I don't know what it is about jail and the book of Enoch. But uh, I go into the jail, and it's like, hey, I found the book of Enoch. That's weird, dude. Do you know that there are giants in Scripture? Oh, boy, here we go. Yep. Yes, I do. Many scholars are going to tell you that the Word of God today is just like another book. It's read, but it's not studied. Believed upon, but not acted upon. Willing to die for, but not to live for. Unless we hold up this scripture to be the word of God and act upon its principles and its statutes as if it is 100% accurate and true, we ourselves will fall to a deceiver that's telling us that we can do whatever we want and still claim to have faith in Jesus. Amen. The fact is this. Our faith comes by hearing. And hearing by what? The Word of God. I could tell you, how many people in here study other translations? Okay, out of whatever. Wow, how many, how many here are King James fans? Oh, cool. Uh, how many are NIV fans? Okay, how many are, uh, like, enjoy parallel Bibles where they got them side by side? We can study side by side. I don't, I'm not an advocate, see on mine, well, it's, it's, I used to have a name on the outside until duct tape took over. And duct tape was used in Bible times. Real <laughs> yeah, real ducks then. <laughs> That's AJ for you, wasn't that a stupid statement? <laughs> That's good, bro. <laughs> trying to get that out of my head now. We as the New Testament church need to act upon what the word says if you really believe it. If you really believe it. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. And they went forth and it preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. So if you're confirming the word, you confirm the word by your actions, by fruit. If Aiden comes to Jesus, and I know that he has Jesus, and we let him out on the street, I'm going to know who he is and what he's doing by the fruit. I'll know it. 
There's so many people that will graduate the program and they'll go out there and, man, I'm really doing good for Jesus. Then I find out, of course, they've been sleeping around or they've been drinking up a storm and everything. And I keep telling them, listen, I'm going to know you by your fruit. What are you doing for Jesus? If you're doing something for Jesus, I don't need to worry about it. Okay? Let God be God. Let God be God. Luke chapter 8, verse 21. The importance of knowing the real word and the accuracy of the word is so important because it is the actions that you will do. How do you know what to do if it's not in the word? A lot of people say, well, I'm a smoker and you can't tell me that in the word, it doesn't say anything against smoking. Hmm. Hmm. How much you want to bet? God's calling me. You see, your body's a temple. Everybody know where I'm going with this? It's the same thing with gluttony. Welcome to the United States. These people that commit adultery, I can't stand them. God, God is against them. I think I got a hernia. <laughs> you see, you need to understand that if the word says it, we have to act upon it. If you're a believer in the word, I'll know you're a believer in the word because I can see it in your life. Your love for Jesus. Luke chapter 8, verse 21, and he answered and said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which do what? They hear the word. That's logos. Okay, they hear it, the word of God, and they what? And they do it. That means you've read it, you understand it. And so if you're going to do that, then don't you want to read the right one? Don't you want to make sure that it's correct? Don't you want to make sure? So you need to do your own homework. And I will tell you, there's a lot of translations that are coming out, and I already warned you of this, that you're going to have to watch out for. They take away from the deity. They take away from the trinity. They take away from a virgin birth. They take away from sodomy. There's no sodomy in the new ones anymore. Why? Because they don't want it to be unlawful. They want it to be lawful. Look at us. Look where we are. Look the laws that are being passed to protect sin. To protect sin. And the laws that keep the righteous out of their business. When we're supposed to be preaching to them, telling them about Christ, laws are being passed to keep us from even doing that. You see, right is going to be wrong, and wrong is going to be right. God have mercy on us. But that is where we are. Folks, the reason I did this, and I know there wasn't a lot of scripture the last two weeks, this week and last week, but I did it because I wanted you to know where the Bible comes from. I wanted you to know, how many, have, how many have learned something from this? Did it make a difference? I hope so. Some of you didn't raise your hand. That's, it's okay. Point them out. Point out. <laughs> Sorry about your eye, brother. Man, that's boogered up, isn't it? <laughs> this right here, after I'm done, I want you to come. Please don't touch it, but I want you to look at it. I want you to take a careful look at it. I want you to see the importance of it, and you can tell the importance of it by how it was written. There's nothing sloppy on this at all. Every jot, every tittle, every little foot line at the bottom, every dot, it means something. And when it was put down, the calligraphy of it, in other words, the exactation of every line means something. So they could not go wrong. And 750 years ago, this one was written with copper ink out of Yemen, sewn together, the leather sewn together. You could see they get so wide and then they sew that to another and sew that to another because he works on this piece for a long time until it's done. But you got one guy 
that sat down and he literally copied the scroll verbatim. And I want you to see it. This was not done sloppy as to just make another copy and get it out there. It had to be perfect. And if it wasn't perfect, you were punished because you had the ability to make sure and translate it accurately. 54 men came together. The best of the best were hired by King James. They put them in six different groups, like I said. And each one of them groups corrected the other groups. And if you did anything purposely, you were reprimanded for it. Okay, if it was purposely, everybody makes little mistakes, but they were all corrected. They went through six times. The seventh time, it went to one other group, which is very interesting. Okay, there's always the seventh in there. It went to another group of six, and those six were made the last final any corrections that were made to it. And that's what we have in our hands today. I thank God for the accuracy of His Word. I thank you that it was preserved to where we can read it and we can act upon it. Now, if you're here today, the first thing I'm going to do without hesitation, now that you know that that book is accurate and it's true, if you haven't received Christ into your life, by the way, you can't separate Christ in that word. So if you receive Christ into your life, you also have to receive what? The word. You want to get to know him? Come on. Here it is. And right when you think you know him, keep reading because you're going to get something else and get something else and get something else. If you're here today and you say, you know, Pastor, I really want to get to know Jesus. For some odd reason, I open the scripture and I don't get it. It's not real plain to me and, and I really want to get it. Let me tell you how. It's called, ye must be born again. Because the Spirit will give you all things that you need. He will help translate it to you. He'll help do everything that you need. If you're here today and you say, I need that salvation for real, then these altars are open for you. And I would just ask you to come. If you're here today and you say, Pastor Tim, the word of God has not been the important thing in our home. I understand God and I mention God. We have prayer before a meal. But the word of God has never been that important thing, that scroll. You guys, we have that word, okay? But understand that we don't treat it like this. It's because we've been spoiled with it. So if you're here today and you said, I have not made the word of God what it should be in my home, then if you want, you can grab your spouse or your children, whoever's here with you today, and you can, you can bow where you are. You can come up here in these stairs. But somewhere, sometime, you're going to have to make a choice. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You're going to have to make a choice to receive the word of God into your life. And as I pray, if this is a decision that you honestly want to make, I, do, I, I never pry, try to manipulate people to come up here. I'm not into that at all. But if you're here today and you know that the Word of God has not been a priority and you want to make it a priority, then I'm going to ask you to come and to pray and to make it a priority. Just ask God to do whatever it takes to make His Word a priority in your home. Bow your heads with me. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, for everybody that is in this room. As a scroll is before us right here, Lord God, the accuracy, the incredible perfection that was put into it, all the way up to what we have right in front of us, Lord God. It shows us how we're to walk, how our marriages are supposed to be, how our children are supposed to be, how to conduct ourselves in business. And Lord, the reason that the United States is in trouble is because we left out God. If we've left out God, we've left out the Word of God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would instill in all of us today a want, a hunger and thirst for righteousness, a hunger and thirst for the Word of God. Some people in here don't open their Word during the day. 
much less study with their families or walk through things with their families. I pray, Lord God, that you will bless, Lord God, these families. Make the word a priority. When they go home today, have them come up with a time from now on during the week. Kids, if there's any way that we can do this, we need to sit down and we need to go over scripture. This needs to be a priority in our life. Why? Because we care about eternity. Our children, we're losing them in the schools because they don't have another education. Their other education, it needs to be in the word of God. God, have mercy on us, please, please, please. Lord, we'll just take the crumbs from the table if they'll change our, our lives and help our children. Whatever we need, whatever you want for us, we are here. We are ready. We love you. We want you. We desire you. We're crying out for you. And the way that we get you is through the word of God. And so as we read it, Lord God, what? What an honor to be able to read it. They didn't read it for, for years. It was given to them by somebody else. But now we got it. And now we understand it. God bless us, Lord God, as we try to walk it. Today as we leave, Lord God, I pray that there'll be another person, Lord God, this week that we go after. Just one. One. Just one. And I pray that we will minister to that person just like Bo did to Chris. We'll minister to that person and we'll say, listen, I know, I know what you need. I have it. I have the answer. His name is Jesus. Please walk us through that, Lord. Today, we just want to give you the glory. Help us, Lord God. Forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all unrighteousness unrighteousness every bit of it the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name we quote the scripture for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life but the next part of it is so important he didn't come to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved there's no condemnation in here to people this is, this is your word going out, Lord God, hoping that it doesn't return void because the word says that it doesn't. So grab their hearts and bring them forward, Lord. Grab their hearts and help them to get with their families today and make decisions that are going to change eternity. And we will love you for it and give you all glory and honor. You are a very, very cool God. And I love you for it. In Jesus' name, everyone said.